Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues This is session 11, part 1 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance still focusing on the human conscience explaining the external influences that affect and control the development of a desire to listen to and act upon truth received by the conscience. The session was recorded on the 10th of January 2018 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Hello everyone, how are you today? Myself and Mary are here, welcome Mary to discuss with you again the subject of the conscience in this seemingly never-ending series of discussions about the law, God's laws pertaining to forgiveness and repentance. So we're on session, I think it's 11 now, yes. isn't it? Just check my notes. 11. Yes, it's 11. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, we're just continuing the discussion as we've been having with you over the past uh, couple of weeks uh, for us, but it's been a couple of sessions for you. We're having this discussion about the human conscience and how it relates to forgiveness and repentance. Now, today we're going to focus more of our attention on how the external influences affect the operation of the human conscience. And in other words, how you as an individual uh, connect to your conscience depending upon what kind of external influences you receive. So that's the kind of thing we're going to discuss with you today. It's quite an important topic because most people don't realize that God's truth coming through the human conscience is distorted quite a lot by your own, firstly, your own desires and passions and motivations, which is what we discussed the last session, but also by all of these external factors, external pressures, things that have happened to you that influence how your you, how you respond to your own conscience and therefore how you respond to God's truth as it's communicated via the conscience. So that's going to be our topic of discussion today. And obviously, it is there's still a continuation of the uh, discussion of the laws of repentance and forgiveness. And remember, we have to discuss the conscience because the conscience is a major motivator for you to eventually get into the state where you would like to forgive somebody or get into the state where you want to repent for something that you have done. And so the conscience is a key part of your understanding as to what will trigger you or motivate you into forgiveness and repentance. So before we get into our discussion today, for the sake of our viewers, we'll do a quick review of everything we've discussed in this series so far. So Jesus, you'll remember in sessions <laughs> one to three, we introduced the topic of God's laws, the purpose of God's laws, God's truth, how we can determine God's truth. And then we started to introduce God's truth about forgiveness and repentance. Yeah, and we discussed quite a lot of different things, didn't we, about, you know, repentance and forgiveness itself, the emotional connectivity that we, we need to have to that process, the role, you know, the role that it plays in our, in our life as mm -hmm. well but also how much emotion is, if, is required in terms of working through forgiveness and repentance. And so if we're, if we're in a state of denial of emotion, then it's going to be very, very hard to enter a state of forgiving somebody or repenting for something we've done. That's right. And then, uh, then in the second uh, group of, of discussions, mm -hmm. we, we introduced the law of compensation yep. and we focused our attention on compensation itself and how that plays a role in forgiveness and repentance. And there we looked at things like what compensation is, what kind of a role it does play, but also the types of compensation, you know, compensation in kind or proportionate compensation or what happens when you sow nothing, you know. Yeah. Of course, you, you, you don't reap nothing. So that, <laughs> yeah, we talked about that as well. And these were all discussed in sessions four to eight, in five different sessions we discussed those issues. That's right. So the first three sessions we were sort of introducing what what we're going to get to at the end yeah, again yeah. and then um, for the sake of everyone watching we realize look we need to talk about these other factors so as you mentioned the law of compensation and then in our last two sessions 
and it will be probably for our next three sessions. But, That's right, um, yeah. but in our last two sessions, we introduced another really important factor that pertains to forgiveness and repentance, and that is the human conscience. So yes. uh, in session nine, we, we defined a lot about it, how it operates. And then yesterday, we began to talk about the internal motivations that I need to have if I'm actually going to ever hear my conscience. Yes, yeah, so yesterday we were discussing in particular the desires. And remember in our assistance groups that we referred to desire as having faith for some change in the future mm -hmm. and that desire actually causes change. So yesterday we were focusing, or last session we could say, yeah. we were focusing our attention on what's going to cause some change to, to, to enable us to become more sensitive and connected to the conscience mechanism. Today, of course, in, this is now session 11, mm -hmm. we're focusing our attention now on the external factors that control or limit our ability to connect to our own conscience mm -hmm. and what happened to us. In other words, what's now determined our condition, our soul condition or our current state. And remember, that's what determines our current state of will as well in many cases. So. Here we're looking at today, we're looking at what determines our current state, what, what's the mess we've got into. Mm -hmm. And it's not just our, all, all our own fault, of course, because mm -hmm. obviously society and our parents and, and a lot of our personal actions have taken a part, have played a part in the destruction of our connection to our conscience. Yeah. And notice I didn't say the destruction of our conscience because that's impossible to destroy. <laughs> you can All you can do is destroy your connection to it. And... And today we're going to focus more attention on, OK, what are those external factors and those internal things that have caught that is now the, to determining our condition, our current condition and how that de determines how much whether we really want to have a connection with our conscience yeah. or, or how much we have a connection with our conscience. So what we'd like to do is recommend to all of our viewers, you guys, to, to if you have not watched the previous sessions up to now, remembering that this is, I think, session 11, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. So, so if you haven't watched the previous 10 sessions, our recommendation is to go back, watch those previous 10 sessions so that you've got a good grounding for what we're going to discuss with you today. First up, we're going to do a review of the personal fundamental desires that we need to have that affect our sensitivity to conscience. So we're doing that this, today, aren't we? So that it's a good way to introduce what we're going to, to follow on, really, once we talk about what we did yesterday, what we talk about today really yes. follows on neatly, doesn't it? Yeah, so uh, it's important that we remember our last session because if we, if we remember the content of our last session, we, were fo we focused our attention firstly on that question. You know, that big question yeah. was, remember the, the, the question was basically that if every person on earth has a connection to their conscience or has a conscience and has a connection to the conscience and God's sharing God's truth through that conscience to each individual, then why is it that we all don't believe the same thing about the same, the same matters, the same mm -hmm. subjects? And, and it's a very good question and it required some some addressing, you know. <laughs> and so what we did first is we broke that addressing the, that question into two sections. The first section we covered in the last session. Yeah. And that first section is really all about our desires and how our desires control and motivate the conscience and how our desires are the main factor, one of the primary factor, in fact, that cause us to either have some sensitivity to and obey our mm -hmm. conscience or desensitize to it and disobey it. Yeah. And so we needed to focus our attention on what are the desires, the primary desires we need to develop if we're going to actually enjoy this connection of God's truth coming through to us via this conscience mechanism. That's so right. there we basically discussed uh, six main areas, didn't we? And uh, from memory, the first one was our desire to love. Yep. The second was our desire for truth. The third was our desire for humility. The fourth one is our desire for faith. Mm -hmm. The fifth was the desire for morality. And the sixth was the desire for ethics. And yesterday, or our previous session, we covered all of those points in a lot of detail to give our viewers a lot of ideas about why each one of those particular qualities or desires 
is an essential part of connecting to the conscience. And and from, from the by the end of the discussion, yes, the previous sessions discussion, our listeners should have got to the point of saying, ah, oh, now I can see why maybe I don't have a very strong connection with <laughs> my own conscience. Yeah. And also I can see what I need to do about that if I'm ever going to have a good connection to the conscience and therefore be able to regularly receive God's truth about all matters. And remember, we're receiving, the conscience receives God's truth about all matters, including physical, emotional, spiritual, sexual, every part of life, including the external uh, truths, like the external truths of the universe are all can be received through the conscience. The potential knowledge is via, uh, available via the conscience mechanism. So, so we can see that yesterday our focus was more upon this whole concept of what are these personal desires, whereas today's session is more about what are the external factors that have now determined my soul condition and, and we need to discuss that in a lot more detail, which we'll do in a minute. That's right. So the first thing we need to talk about is that influences upon personal desire control the operation of the conscience. So yeah. yesterday we talked, didn't we, about these desires that we have and how they impact upon how sensitive we are to the conscience. Mm. Now we're going to talk about the influences on desire because obviously, if we don't have the desires that we had yesterday, we haven't gone about developing them. Why haven't we? There's mm. been some influences, hasn't mm. there? Yes. So a very important thing for us to note, uh, again, for our listeners, is that by giving us free will, every single one of God's children has free will, and therefore they have the capacity and ability to influence others and their environment, and they all do. Mm. <laughs> Yes, and also we all get influenced. Like, yes. the, and we talked yesterday uh, in the previous session about how you know many of us feel influence is bad, mm -hmm. but the reality is we get influenced in every single part of our life, and many of those influences are quite good in the sense that they have positive outcomes for us. And if we didn't have this kind of external influence occurring, then quite often we wouldn't know the things that we know, we wouldn't be able to do the things we do, and we often wouldn't know the events available to us around us and things like that. So there's a whole lot of enjoyable things that happen through influence. So mm -hmm. influence by itself is not a bad thing. It's just what kind of influence and what's the overall goal of that influence is, is what we need to determine. And that's a very important point we want to make today, isn't it? That mm. how we choose to be influenced is a personal decision. Mm. So today we're going to introduce a lot of external influences, um, but we need to remember there's personal decisions. Yeah, they're all putting pressure on us, yes. these external influences. But we, we can withstand any kind of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to make some decisions to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And we're all we're all influenced by internal emotional conditions, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, and by other people as well. So it's it's an intermix of things going on all the time, isn't it? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. All right. Um, but obviously how we choose to be influenced has a huge bearing on how sensitive we are to the conscience. Yes. And and how much we develop that desire to become more sensitive to the conscience. Yes, and here we need to bear in mind too that obviously a child doesn't choose to be influenced. It is often influenced without a choice being involved. Mm. And so many of the external factors that affect our, the use of our conscience are actually, have actually been the decisions of others, particularly in our childhood, the decisions of our society, the decisions of our parents, what, what choices and feelings they had, but also how they influenced our feelings when we were children, has a large bearing on why we are now not as connected to the conscience as we could be. So, so we need to bear in mind that it's not all just our choice, but we now as adults have choice. <laughs> we, yeah. we, do we continue to allow these external factors to influence us? Or do we do something about these external factors and also it's important for us to understand as adults why it is that something that is so basically core to our being, which is the conscience itself, mm -hmm. has become such a thing of 
rarity in terms of connection for, for humanity. It's like, why is it that most of us are not connected to it, even though God created the mechanism and it's been there since the time of conception, or even before it's been there, but obviously the time of conception is the first time we become aware of it. And if God's had it there for that, from that point of time onwards, then why, why is it that uh, we have this detunement to the conscience? What, what's going on? What kind of influences and factors have caused us to have so much of a detunement from something that is so core to our soul's creation? And that's really what we want to answer for people today. Yeah. Mm. So we're going to see today that there's influences that have already occurred that were really outside of our control. Mm -hmm. um, they, have, they have influenced us and they've created this condition we're in now. But we also want to remind people that there's, it, we now have choices about whether those things continue to influence us. And, and if we choose to be guided by love, then a lot of those influences we will be able to overcome. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that's our focus of our discussion today. And it's quite an important one because unless we understand how the problem of our determinant or lack of sensitivity to the conscience was created, mm -hmm. then it's obviously very, very hard to overcome it or undo yeah. that damage. Whereas when we do understand it, we've got now some hope to overcome it and to undo it so that we can gain back the connectivity to conscience that we all had at the moment of our conception, but was slowly degraded over time due to a number of factors. Yeah, mm. yeah. And before we get into looking at these external influences, I just want to read a paragraph from our outline. Sure. I think it's quite uh, good. Uh, if we're guided by love, the choice of what influence we allow is easy. If we are uneducated about love or are guided by addictions, anger, fears, and other developed emotional conditions, then we either avoid choices that are loving or we don't even know what choices are loving. Mm. This all has a bearing on our personal desire to be sensitive to and act upon the conscience mechanism. Mm. So that's the, that's the precursor to what, everything else we want to say today, isn't it? That's right. Remember from our last session, we talked about the importance of love in it, 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 the whole reason why God shares truth for, for, to us is so that we have the option to be able to experience love through mm -hmm. the process. So, so the importance of love in everything is it, it's, it cannot be understated. Yeah. And, and the problem is that for the majority of us, we don't even know what love is really anymore, mm -hmm. either because we have become so used to our addictions being fed or because we've never been educated about what love is, or we've been, and most of us have been, completely educated about a, a substitute version, you know, of love, which in a lot of cases is actually abuse, not yes. love. Yeah. And yet we still see it as love. And so we have some very, very poor understand, have a very poor understanding of love in our day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we are naturally going to be quite detuned from our conscience. And so what we need to do is work out how do we undo this mess that <laughs> has been created? A lot of it has been created without our uh, real cognizant awareness, you know, mm -hmm. as a child. But a lot of it also has been created based upon what we are now trying to do, which is to feed our addictions and, and our demands yeah. from society and from people generally and from our relationships. And, and so, you know, obviously we need to look at all of these factors to see you know, what is the real problem here and how can we resolve this problem? Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about five major influences. We've made five groupings of influences. Mm. So we'll talk about them today. Uh, they are early childhood experiences from parenting and schooling. Mm -hmm. Uh, the infiltration of family emotions and beliefs. So that means us taking on, ha having taken in and now having within us these family emotions and beliefs. And there we could say, remember the soul is like a great big absorber. And when there's no intellect to control or, or other things to guide what it, 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 the soul is absorbing, which is exactly what it's like for a child, 
then the, soul, the, the child's soul absorbs most things. Yeah. And so if the family has a certain set of emotions, yeah. then the child absorbs those emotions and it becomes a part of itself in yes. that way. Yes, mm. yeah. And similarly, the infiltration of societal emotions and beliefs. Mm. So very, the same thing, same thing happens, happens yeah. there. Uh, our developed emotional condition. Yes. So this includes things like fear of attack, fear of disapproval, fear about our very survival, um, fears of love, fears of truth, all kinds of different fears are often interfering with how sensitive we are to the conscience, aren't they? Yes, and we could say with our developed emotional condition that you remember that again, we, some of it has been externally influenced, but a lot of it also is our personal choices that mm -hmm. we now make. So many of us make these choices daily where we're constantly operating out of harmony with love. And of course, those personal choices that we're making out of harmony with love do have a detrimental effect on our connection with God through the conscience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is why we need to discuss the developed condition that we have right now. Yes. Yep. Yep. And the fifth one is a lack of education, so a lack of knowledge about the existence of the conscience. That plays mm. a major role. Yes, as we have said before, uh, the earth and people on it have a lot of uh, misunderstandings and confusion about the conscience and how it operates and why it's there. Everyone sort of has a bit of an idea that there's such a thing, otherwise there wouldn't even be a word called conscience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is most of us have a very, very, very uh, like a, a large variety of um, ways that we consider yes. perceptions that we have about what it actually is. Yes. And uh, this is something that we need to discuss a bit more deeply as well, how this lack of education has affected us. Yeah. Mm. So they're the five different areas we're going to cover today. Mm. And in each area, we're going to look at it from two different angles, or mm. two different aspects. Um, that is how my personal experience affects my current sensitivity mm -hmm. to conscience. Yeah. And so how, why am I right now in the mess I am in? Yes. It is basically the, 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 the aspect we're looking utterly at. Utterly confused about what is my conscience, what isn't, what, what is a conscience, all of that stuff. Yeah. Why well, don't I have a good understanding of it right now? Yep. yep. Which is very important, isn't it? Yes. But equally important is the other aspect we're going to look at, which is why don't I, how does my personal experience affect why I don't even want to be sensitive to my conscience. Yes. Um, and this, again, has a bearing on yesterday's uh, discussion with all the desires that must be developed in order to hear the conscience. A lot of the things we'll talk about today impact on why I don't want to ever be sensitive to my conscience and why I don't ever want to develop those um, five or six, des six desires we discussed yesterday. Yes, you could say this second aspect or second angle that we're looking at things is about, really a lot about how, why it is people get so angry about, once they hear about the conscience, they often get very angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that's because, they're, they're, you know, there are desires within us that are actually working in disharmony to mm. our a, desire to connect to a conscience. It, we don't, so a lot of the times we don't want to know what to do. In fact, there is the common saying on the planet, isn't there, of ignorance is bliss. Yes. In other words, it's lovely to be ignorant, you know. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth from God's perspective. The more knowledge we have, the more power, the more understanding, the more love, the more Potent happiness and joy. The more potential for change. Yeah, of course, there's so many things that truth gives to us. But unfortunately, the majority of us on the planet still think that ignorance is bliss. <laughs> and, and there must be a reason why yeah. we believe that. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to analyse why we believe such things. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. So what we're going to do is basically discuss a lot of examples too during our sessions today. So rather than just presenting a whole heap of theory, we want to sort of add some examples so that it, all of our listeners can sort of connect with, ah, oh, that's probably happened to me in my yeah. childhood, or wow, that's probably a decision that I make in my day-to-day -day life. And hopefully these examples will help you understand some of the material we present today. Let's look at our first set of external influences. Childhood experiences and how they impact upon my sensitivity to conscience. All right, babe. 
Yes. So, so really, you can you can see. I think anybody would be able to logically see that parenting offers obviously must affect our sensitivity to the conscience, but also must affect our desire mm. to be sensitive to the conscience as well. So the real question becomes: How does the way in which I was raised impact upon, firstly, this, my current sensitivity to the conscience? And then secondly, how does the way I was raised impact upon my desire to be sensitive yes. to the conscience? And obviously we need to start with one probably primary thing. Let's look at our parents. <laughs> <laughs> now, do our parents understand the conscience? Well, I think the majority of people would have to say that their parents have not said anything to them at all <laughs> about their conscience, or if they have, they've had a very, they've had a lot of misunderstanding about the conscience. So firstly, we can see that parents themselves, firstly, usually lack understanding about the conscience. Secondly, uh, which means obviously they've got no idea about how it operates and, mm. and what it does and, and that it's God's communication of truth via a mechanism in the soul and all of those kind of factors associated with the truth about the conscience. Yeah. But also, most of the time, parents wish to ignore their own conscience because they've got inside of themselves already a clear guy, a set of things that they want to do. Mm -hmm. And usually that's to meet most of their personal addictions and desires. And, and to do that and have this voice in your ear, so-called, mm -hmm. saying, uh, that's probably not such a good thing. Yep. Obviously, you know, most people wish to ignore that. And then thirdly, um, they just generally don't have an understanding of how it works anyway. So, so why have I got this voice in my head? That's a bit strange. <laughs> you know, that's not what I feel like doing. Why is it telling me that? Yeah, you know, yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. And, and, and so you can see that the general condition of parents is such that there is no real awareness of the conscience and there's a l deep lack of education of the conscience. So it's impossible really for them to educate their children about such matters. And that's got to have quite a severe uh, uh, impact upon a child when, it, when it's being brought up, obviously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because now the child has a difficulty to understand the exact things that the parent is, is finding it difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah. And the second major uh, factor here in parental influence is the fact that most parents actually want their children to replace their sensitivity to, with the conscience with uh, the sensitivity to what the parents would like the, for the child to do. Yes. So what, really what the, what the parent wants is the parent has usually inbuilt in it, and this occurs whether you're religious or not religious, and it doesn't matter really what racial background or social background you come from or what a kind of education you have. The parent generally has a set of uh, you could say spiritual, emotional, sexual, and physical uh, belief systems and emotions associated with those belief systems. Yeah. And that, that's already in the parent. And as a result, most of the time, the parent wants the child to embrace exactly the same set of belief systems as the parent themselves has embraced. Yeah. Now, what that means then is anything that disagrees with the parents' belief systems, and frequently the conscience will disagree mm -hmm. with the belief systems that have been established. Because as we've already said, most belief systems are established through addiction and you know fault, unloving desires and so forth. So, so what happens is that most parents now feel they've got to replace the child's conscience with thoughts of the parents mm -hmm. instead of the conscience. So, so what they're trying to do really is get the parents are trying to get their belief system inside the head of the child instead of allowing God's truth to be inside the head of the child, yep. you could say. So parents can do this in a number of ways, can't they? They can do it in a very selfish way in that, oh, look, I don't want my child to challenge me in any way. So I'm going to become very controlling and forceful parent that sort of dictates how the child thinks and behaves and feels. Mm -hmm. um, but even well-meaning parents, so-called well-meaning parents could fall into this trap, couldn't they? When they think, look, I've, I know the truth about something and it's wonderful and I just really want you to know it and, mm -hmm. and actually become quite forceful in that way. Um, 
And that has an equally detrimental effect, doesn't it? Yeah, or, perhaps not quite as not detrimental, quite as, detrimental as, the, as the attacking yeah, method, yeah, but, yeah. but it does have a, a detune the child to God's truth coming mm-hmm. through its conscience. Mm-hmm. So, so if we look at the two ways most parents work, basically there's a reward system for when the child believes in and agrees with the parent's belief systems. Mm-hmm. And there's a punishment system which varies in its intensity from just emotional blackmail (laughs) through to bribery and then into some very abusive action, uh, even more abusive actions such as violence and and so forth that uh, you could say is a punishment system. So so frequently the parent starts engaging the child in, in a reward and punishment system in order to replace the child's conscience with the parent's belief system. Yeah. And this is quite damaging to the child because now the child is, is quite confused as well. On one hand, it's receiving truthful information from God about all of these systems. But on the other hand, it's got huge amounts of parental emotion involved that it's got to also assess, equate and examine as to where, how much that intense emotion may, in fact, in the end, harm it. Mm-hmm. and even potentially kill it, mm-hmm. if it if it disagrees too much. So, so what the child starts doing then is starts discounting its conscience in favour of the parental belief systems and emotions. Yeah. And it either happens in a very insidious way with a gentle parent who's just suggestive all the time, yeah. and occasionally emotionally blackmailing and mm-hmm. Also giving physical rewards, you know, yes. and also applying physical punishments. And when I say physical punishments, many times they're emotional. So in other words, you just even just a simple thing, you don't get the sweet if you do this or you mm. believe that. Or if you said that to me today, I'm going to be angry. Tomorrow, if you if you agreed with me, I'll be happy with you. Just just basic things like that can insidiously affect yeah. the child and and cause the child to now not have a connection to its own conscience. And the poor child now is in the state where all it's really sensitive to is the parent or the parents, or you could say it's environment of upbringing. Yes. Because it might not just be parents. Like in many families on the planet today, we have parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, all involved in the child's upbringing. Anyone who's a primary caregiver even, it could be a very significant a person who's not even related to you that you spend a significant amount of time with. Exactly. Can like have this kind of effect. A lot of, of people in the Western world now have childcare from a very, very young age yeah. for the majority of their day, for yeah. example. Now, obviously, that's going to have quite a significant effect on the child's uh, con- concept of what is true and what is not as well. Yeah, or if I have a parent who's living with someone who's not my parent, but that person is heavily influencing and controlling the environment that me and my parents are living in, or my parent and I are living in, then that person will have a, a very similar effect to the one that we're talking about. Exactly. So we're talking here about the environment that the child is being brought up in which obviously is not just the sum, it's not just their parents because it's the sum total of their parents, their schooling, their, their education system, particularly during their formative years up to the age of seven, mm-hmm. and many other factors are involved here. But you can see in almost every case, the adult, whoever the adult is in the relationship with the child, is generally imposing their belief systems, their emotional belief, their emotions and their belief systems about all these different areas of life so, on the child. Yeah, and some of those areas are uh, how what I believe, uh, how I behave physically, how I behave sexually, yeah. how I behave um, with friends and socially, how all of these things, there's a lot of um, influence upon a growing child about all of those things. There is. Yeah. Yeah. So here we're looking at this is what's this is what is affecting my current sensitivity That's right. to my conscience. That's so this right. is the first aspect we're looking at. This is my history, if you like. This is my that history. That has caused me to be where I am right now. Yeah. Yep. And in summary, what we're saying is my current sensitivity uh, to my conscience is impacted upon 
in one of these primary areas, which is my uh, primary caregivers growing up, mm -hmm. and the things that they did were place pressure on me, <laughs> um, either subtle or overt, mm -hmm. uh, to take on, to replace my sensitivity with my conscience that God created me with, with their own ideas and beliefs. And they used a system of reward and punishment to move mm. me along that process. Yes, so essentially the child now is not sensitive to God's truth coming via the conscience, but is now sensitive to the work, social and, and parental environment in which it's being brought up. Yeah. In other words, the child is more sensitive to what all the adults around it think and feel mm. than it is sensitive to what God thinks and feels about yes. any matter. And so now the child has a priority system inside of themselves. What God thinks and feels about any matter is down here. And what adults that they can see who are impacting their day to day life think and feel their consideration of that in terms of a priority is way up here. Mm -hmm. Very, very important for their livelihood, their life even and their existence even as well as their emotional connectivity with the world around them, their social state and everything. Yeah. So now, instead of them being very connected to what God's truth is going to be, they are going to be connected to what the personal truth of the adults around them, who, whichever adult is around them at the time who is mm -hmm. the most dominant, will become the consideration of the child. So all of us who are struggling to have a connection with our conscience right now, this has most certainly happened. Mm -hmm. And it's happened in any family where you decide you're going to do something different to the rest of the family and there's a huge amount of pressure and rebellion uh, and attack or resistance placed upon you, then this process most certainly happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so this is our current state. Yeah. Now we want to examine, well, what effect does this influence also have on our desire to change our state? Yes. Well, it, I think it's quite obvious there yeah, again, I hope isn't so. it? Yeah. Because, it, because if the parent is already in this state where they're quite insistent that their beliefs and their truth, if you like, their personal way of doing things is right, then naturally any time the child desires to move away from the consideration of the parental system of beliefs, it is going to also be re uh, penalised, mm -hmm. punished, if it moves away, if it rebels, or rewarded if it stays in mm -hmm. harmony with mm -hmm. those systems of beliefs. Yeah. So now there is this really strong feeling inside of the child who's now an adult going, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't get away from that, you know, I can't move away from what everyone around me is doing because it's dangerous mm -hmm. to move away from it. And, and obviously there's a lot of fear that a, that a person has as an adult yeah. relating to becoming someone who is different to what the general person in their society and their family has been brought up to be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so this development of, of a desire to actually tune into my conscience, we could say in summary, that's impacted upon by the fact that primarily uh, in my childhood, I was influenced to have my parents' beliefs. And now every time I go to challenge the parental paradigm, um, I'm punished in some way, emotionally or, other, or financially. Mm -hmm. um, and when I act in harmony with it, I'm rewarded mm. in a similar way. Yes, yeah, so yeah. basically what this does is put the child in the position, who, who, by the way, could now be an adult, right? Puts the person in a position where they are considering direct confrontation with society and parents. Yeah. And, and, and if they choose to listen to God's truth through the conscience, most of the, anybody who does that eventually will find themselves in direct confrontation with society and parents, not through their own choice, but because the people around them want them to get back to the way they were before. Yeah. And this is a huge motivation to not go ahead yeah. and develop a desire yeah. to connect to your conscience, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's now talk about some examples of that. Sure. Our first example is conscience and challenging family and parental beliefs. 
So here we're talking about the child, basically through the operation of its conscience, challenging some beliefs in the parents that obviously the parents are very addicted to holding on to. Now, these could be beliefs relating to social issues, how they relate to society. They could be religious issues. In other words, the parents might have a religion that the child is now feeling like it doesn't want to follow anymore. And it could be related to polit politics. You know, the parents have political beliefs that the child doesn't want to accept. It could be related even to things like relationships, like, and, and we'll discuss probably uh, yes. relationships at other times as well during these examples. But it could be just, a, you know, the per parents don't like that family, and, and so you shouldn't have a relationship with that family. Mm -hmm. and, and it could be like many of these things are, are things that are very, when, when a person connected to the conscience, they go, what? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so, so the child, a lot of the times when the parent says they come up with a political system or, of belief that is really out there, the child's basically through the connection with the conscience going, what? I don't, what yeah. Why would I have that for? Yeah. And then, of course, the, con the, the child now, who now might even be an adult now, is going, okay, I don't want to have that belief system. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's not logical. It's not very loving and, mm -hmm. and so forth. They might have a lot of things that they feel about it. But unfortunately, it depends on how much pressure the parent will place on the child now as to what the child will do. And as I say constantly, this is applying to adult children. Like, like there are many adults who are 30, 40, 50 years old still, who, who are still really doing exactly what their parents want them to do because to do the opposite would result in huge amounts of trauma that the child doesn't want to engage. The child doesn't want to be in a direct confrontation with their parent on the issue. So, so you can see, as soon as the child is worried about the direct confrontation and the severity of it, and, and as you know from your personal experience and I know from mine, the severity of uh, confrontation depends a lot upon what it is you're confronting at the mm -hmm. time. You know, sometimes you're confronting the, ch the per parents' beliefs about themselves. You know, this is a part of their belief systems. Uh, how do they think about themselves? Well, if the child's confronting that, the child's going to get hammered, usually. Yeah. Um, and unless the, the parent is a very self-reflective parent, it's highly unlikely the child won't get hammered. <laughs> and, uh, and then th if it's a religious system, you, it could go so far as to be being killed for your disagreement or rebellion to yeah. your parents' beliefs. And this frequently happens in, in many countries around the world, Christian and non-Christian, yeah. where, where different people uh, have a new belief system and now everyone around them feels righteously determined to harm their life even to the point of killing them yeah. uh, in order to enforce the parental beliefs back on to the system and, and it's very very damaging and, and intense for for the child and an adult child still very damage, uh, damaging and intense for an adult to be able to deal with and cope with these kind of pressures mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, our second example is conscience and children challenging parental lifestyle. So here, what do we want to talk about here? Well, here, here we're talking more about how the parent lives its life. Now, many parents sort of see the child living its life differently to the parent as a commentary about the parent and its lifestyle. Certainly. So, so in other words, the parent goes, well, this is how I live my life. So I do it this way. I, 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 you know, I work in this way. I have my interactions with my social and religious uh, environment this way. And I, you know, have my, my, my general life at home this way. I treat women this way. I treat men this way. And a lot of these ways, of course, are distorted based on their additions. Now, when the child goes, I oh, know, I'm going to live my life different to my, my mum or my dad lived their life. Mm -hmm. Now there's a large degree, for many parents, there's a large degree of con internal confrontation. They observe their child living a completely different life and they see it as a personal slight on their own lifestyle. Mm. Now, now, a lot of parents in that, in that kind of uh, situation will now revert to some form of abusive behaviour, whether it's emotional manipulation right the way through 
into physical violence and, and withdrawal from, from the person just in order to control the lifestyle of the child, rather than seeing that the child has its own choices to make and is allowed to make those particular choices. Now, the question is, how does that affect conscience? Well, God frequently is trying to inform the person who's now making these choices as to what's the best way to live their life. Now, if what God says is the best way to live your life differs greatly from what your parents say is the best way to live your life, and the parents feel that, uh, you know, for, for a child to, to disagree means that the child doesn't respect them and doesn't honour them and so forth, now the parent is going to place a lot of pressure on that child to disconnect from its conscience and revert back to connection to the parent's ideals and beliefs. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's quite a natural thing that the parent does, although very abusive, based upon their emotional injuries. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if we examine it from the point of view of the conscience, it's so destructive to the conscience. Because what it does is it's basically saying that if you put your priority system back on to listening to God's truth, then parents are going to destroy you, however way, whatever way they can, mm. right? In order to get you back into their way of thinking and their way of life. And I'm thinking here as well, we're talking about challenging parental lifestyle, but there's also a lot of messages, isn't there, passed down generationally that um, children either live the exact same lifestyle as their parent or a lot of parents have this feeling, I don't want you to have, I want you to do everything that I never did in my life. True. And so this, either one or the other or a mixture of both is usually what happens. Yes. Those influences using that reward and punishment system that you just talked about and sometimes it's even just guilt or which mom, is a punishment that's what i mean <laughs> it's not so i just wanted to explain for our listeners yes. that it's not necessarily like abject disapproval or rejection at times or, it's or often, violent or violent that, because that, it often is yeah it can be <laughs> and frequently is but sometimes it's things like um subtle uh, projection of i'm so dissatisfied with my life please go and do something or, or better. even worse or, you've made me so ha unhappy that you've made that decision yes. or you've made <laughs> or, me so happy that you've gone and done what yeah, i never did yeah. and so all of these things are influences on how a person chooses to live their life yes but none of it is coming from their conscious consci conscience conscience yeah. <laughs> Um, and what God would tell them is in harmony with truth and therefore in harmony with love. Exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that's the unfortunate part about it is that all of it, even, even like you said, if it's insidiously approving. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you're not careful, it can then feed into their detunement to the conscience. Of course, if a parent approves of the child connecting to its conscience, then that will have a very great of positive effect on the child, uh, even as an adult. So, so the key is, you know, as we've established at the beginning of all this discussion about parents and parental upbringing, the key is that most parents don't, don't know anything about the conscience and certainly don't connect to their own and try to dis disown or, or it can live completely in disharmony to mm. their own conscience. So mm -hmm. naturally, they're going to try to have the child do the same thing. Mm. Mm. You mentioned the parent, though, who encourages the child to tune into their own conscience. Mm -hmm. Can that be uh, problematic if the parent itself is uh, misinformed or uneducated about the conscience? Of course it can be problematic, mm. but it's probably better yep. than, than somebody who's trying to get the child to do what the parent wants. Yes. Because that is a very selfish thing to do. Mm -hmm. when, the, when the parent is trying to educate the child about its own conscience, at least even though the parent may have a distorted view of conscience, mm -hmm. at least now the child is getting a, an idea of being able to connect to something within itself in mm -hmm. order to make decisions and choices. Whereas when the parent's just saying, no, I'm going to replace your conscience with my set of belief systems and demand that you agree with and follow my set of belief systems. Now the parent has, is not even getting the child to even reason on the matter. Mm. So, so there are obviously degrees of severity here about how far, you know, how negative the influence can be. 
right the way through to the fact that my, uh, some p parents could be completely positive in their influence. It's all up to you. It's your decision. It's your choices. You can connect to God and find out the, the truth about this matter if you want to, or you can just ignore God and get on with your life. That's up to you. If you ignore God and get on with your life, it's highly likely you'll make mistakes that you'll feel pain and suffering about. And this kind of education coming from the parent will obviously greatly support the child mm. in its ability to make choices and decisions, even if those decisions and choices are different to the parent and its lifestyle and its beliefs. Mm. So... And of course, contrasting that between just do whatever you want and have no regard for anyone or anything. Of course, this education is saying, no, there's a, there's a being or entity that is loving and truthful that you can tune into and you can assess whether you're receiving those messages by the content of the messages and exactly. those, those kinds of parts. So the, this is about education. We, we are yeah. going to handle a lot of that uh, discussion later down the track today. But, but you can see that giving a child an education about conscience means that you wouldn't be doing things like we're just discussing, no. which is saying, ah, oh, you, you're now disagreeing with my lifestyle. I, you're not honouring me. You're not respecting me. And so now I'm going to disapprove of you. I'm going to get rid of you out of my life and so forth and so forth. Yeah. You know, th those kind of things are very controlling and manipulative. And yet most parents, if not all that I've ever seen, do that in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, our final example is about conscience and children challenging parents' emotions. So we've already discussed um, parental beliefs and parental lifestyle. Let's get on to parental emotions. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is probably the biggest area that uh, most parents really fall down yes. with, actually, when it comes to the child connecting to conscience. Because, uh, because emotions are so raw in us and quite frequently we believe them to be based on some truth. So even though we're angry, we believe we have a right to be angry. Mm -hmm. Or even if we're resentful, we believe we have a right to be resentful. If we hate, we believe we have a right to hate. If we, if we have some kind of religious belief, we believe that religious belief is true. And, and these kind of beliefs established within us emotions of mm. demand mm. that go out of us into our environment. We expect people around who love us to agree with us. Yes. Now, when they agree with our emotion by having a similar emotion, there's a sense of approval. Oh, wow. They're in agreement with me. They yes. feel the same way as I do about that matter. Isn't that lovely? You must love me because you <laughs> feel the same way I do about the matter, right? Then if the child feels something different mm -hmm. about the matter, what? You disrespect me. You dishonor me. You, you know, you're not loving me anymore. You know, I brought you up. I brought you into this world. How dare you do such a thing? Yeah. And now there's this feeling from the parent, which again, very emo highly emotionally charged, projected at the child. Get back in the line or now your whole life seems to be threatened, you know, <laughs> or at least you're going to receive the barrage of these kind of emotions for the rest of it. <laughs> if you continue to hold on to your set of emotions that are different to your parents' emotions. So what a child finds is that as it gives up emotions that are out of harmony with love, that its parent still has, then the child's set of emotional conditions is different to the parent's emotional condition. Mm -hmm. Now, when the child's emotional condition is different to the parent's emotional condition, the parent can feel it. And the parent now is going to probably try to fight for its own emotional condition. Yeah. Unless it has some humility and goes, wow, the child's emotional condition is better. Yeah. That's what I need to go for. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking, you saying child, but really it counts as us at this age. Yes. So always when we're saying child here, we're talking about anybody who's able to make choices and decisions. So that begins at the age of two, basically, mm -hmm. and then, you know, works up from there into mm -hmm. our adult life. And, and we can be hundreds of years old in the spirit world, still doing what our parents <laughs> want us to do yeah. if we're not careful. Yeah. And, uh, and this is why we need to break these kind of problems as, and understand them firstly, and yeah. then break the interdependencies that we have with our parents so that we can connect to what is God's truth about these matters. Mm. Mm. Mm.